yeah, coming to you live from beautiful Austin, Texas, actually a taupe void in Austin, Texas. It's, it's very challenging to, uh, to give these presentations uh, remotely. And so hats off to Matt, because I got to watch his presentation. I really enjoyed it. So, so good job, Matt. I, I, you've left me a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. So I guess I should introduce myself as I'll be, I'll be new to many of you. My name is Richard Ford, um, as we said, based in Austin. And yes, my background is very much um, offensive and defensive. And um, I was lucky enough to sit and help make PhDs and master's students for quite some time too, before being talked back out of my academia days by one of my former students to become a chief scientist of Force Point and then CTO of Siren. Um, if you want to have uh, a little bit more about me, you can you can visit my website and, and come and say hello. Um, and yes, I am the CTO of Praetorian. Now, Praetorian is an Austin-based cybersecurity company, but we're actually um, what we would call remote first. So we are, you know, about half the company works remotely around the US. And we have a large and thriving uh, consulting and services practice, as well as develop our security products. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is I'm going to link up the things that we see in the services side with some of the tools um, that we make. Um, Praetorian as a company is, is really very good at, at what we do. Um, and, you know, we were lucky enough to have among our customers, for example, folks like Twitter and Zoom. So we're, we're working with some really security savvy customers. Um, and one of the things that we try and do is work um, well with the community. So one of the things that we have is a deep commitment to open source. So everything I'm going to tell you about today is basically free. You can go and download it from GitHub. You can play with it. You can tell me you love it. You can tell me you hate it. Um, so it's an opportunity to talk about some of the things that we're doing in the open source world, as well as um, one of the products that we have that also has a, uh, a free sign up. And you can read more about all of that at Pretoria. So, so what are we going to do? Let's take some lessons from the real world. Um, based on some pretty high-end security assessments that our engineers carry out. Let's look at how we chose to respond to those, because one thing that, that happens is you see the same thing again and again and again, right? So, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, oh, we have this command injection. Well, when you see it for the 30th time, you start to wonder, is there a way to automate this? And as part of our services practice, we've built a lot of tooling that we use in our um, engagements. And now we're starting to open source some of that and make that available to the community. And then I wanna close with just a couple of thoughts on what we as a community need to do or could do to perhaps sort of raise all the boats in the security world, because this really is a community. Your problems are my problems, um, both figuratively and literally, literally, right? When you get compromised, because of supply chain that can lead to a problem for me. So we're all very connected. And so even from a purely selfish standpoint, figuring out how to raise the overall sort of health of the ecosystem is a beautiful thing. So I wanna start with a quick caveat. Everything, there's a couple of examples that I wanna show. Um, the details have been significantly changed because obviously we take client confidentiality very, very seriously. Um, so um, these are real examples, but I decided not to show the actual source code because it's, it's too identifiable. So we've looked through these things at a high level. Um, but yeah, all three of these things are things that we see all the time. So let's start with, with something simple. And, and when I sat down with our, one of our technical directors and services, I said, Peter, what, what should we be talking about? You know, what, if you had, five minutes with, with customers and you could just sit down over a cup of coffee at OWASP, what, what would you want to talk to them about? And he said, well, you know, one of the interesting things that comes up is, is versioning because customers feel very differently about things that we see that are out of date. So one of the things we find all the time if we're doing NetSec is, oh, you have an out of version, uh, out of date version of Nginx or, oh, you have a, vulnerable version of Apache or an AppSec. 
Do we see old libraries built into things that have CVs attached to them? You betcha. Um, what do we see in CorpSec? You want to guess? Yeah, we see things that are out of date. We see it all the time. But in our practice, we've observed two interesting things. One is that Pretorian's customers tend to be pretty security savvy, right? They're pretty high end in the services world. I guess I should rephrase, they're more mature in their security journey. I think that's a fairer way to, to think about it, right? They've invested in that over a period of time and they're engaged with the company like Pretorian because they're looking for very high end services. So typically they don't have a lot of things that are old or when they do, it's because they've looked at the assessment and said, yes, this thing's vulnerable, but we're not calling the vulnerable part of it so it's not exploitable. And I think one of the challenges that we see when we look at versioning is that there are two kinds of, well, there are really three kinds of customer. There's the customer who they've got all this out of date stuff and they're very vulnerable, right? Those are typically not the customers we're dealing with, but, but they're out there, right? If you scan, you know, you, you see these things. Uh, there's a reason why some very old bits of Windows malware are still around. It's because those old versions of Windows are still around. So versions, versions, versions. A customer is security savvy, but it doesn't mean they've patched everything. Sometimes they're so security savvy that they patch what matters. They're optimizing for throughput, and that's difficult. So that when you look at something, just because we see something as old and out of date doesn't mean that it's a risk. And, and it's a problem because when somebody assesses your security remotely, sometimes they're going to ding you. Uh, like if you think about supply chain security, they might scan your environment. And even though nothing's actually exploitable, um, it can be a problem. The other thing is that generally, even when we see something that's that's slightly older and maybe vulnerable, we generally don't take the time to craft a vulnerability for it because those vulnerabilities can be very finicky. And what we've experienced is when we show that to a customer, the customer goes, yeah, okay, you ran something from Metis point. No, it's really not what we did. But, um, you know, it's not the sort of thing that the customer is typically looking for. And the problem with that is that's anything but a virtuous cycle, right? So a virtuous cycle is when you go round and round it and everything keeps getting better. This is a sort of broken cycle. And I think it's partly broken because the tools that we as a community have don't work very well for developers. If you run Black Duck or DevScan, a nice open source um, version of things, to over your code base, there's a pretty good chance you could be confronted with, I don't know, maybe a thousand things that um, are out of date. But, and that's overwhelming. It's like as a, as a pilot, right? I'll use another pilot analogy later, but one of the things they train you about flying at night, they're like, how do you crash land at, at night, Rich? Your engine's out, you're going down. What do I do? And, and your flight instructor say, well, Richard, you, you descend uh, at best possible guide, you point at something dark, not something that's like a street light. And when you get to 50 feet, you turn your landing light on. And if you don't like what you see, you turn it off again, because you're going down either way. Um, Sometimes when we run these scanners, the, the results that we get are overwhelming. And that can be, that can basically lead to the, I turned on the light, I didn't like what I see, I turn it back off again. Um, and I think from another pilot analogy, one of the things they teach you is aviate, navi uh, navigate, communicate, i.e. fly the plane, first and foremost. If you have any spare cycles, know where you are. If you have any spare cycles left after that, talk to people on the radio. It's about priority. Um, and we're not good at prioritizing things. Software rot is, rot is ultimately a terminal disease and it will get you, um, but it can take a while. And so figuring out how to break the cycle with customers is really interesting, right? Because I've even, I've got very good customers who are very, very smart saying it's not helpful to know about certain things because we've already assessed it and we know it's not risky. We have other customers who have no idea that we're running something old. So defenders, we feel your pain, how to fix it. I believe the way is autom automation and making security more accessible. So for those very high-end customers, they've got their arms around this. For customers who are less mature on their security journey, um, you know, one of the things that we can do is we have a system called Chariot. Chariot has a free tier where anybody can sign up and you can connect it to your um, GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever your source code managing uh, system is. And it will do all these scans for you. And it will give you the results. It will let you prioritize them. It will make recommendations. 
and you can sign up for it for free. It's built around a lot of open source tooling because we really believe that in the long term, open source is, is the future for doing security right. And the idea is that it's designed to help make security more available for all in a way that, that is uh, easy and convenient to use. And we made the decision to create a version of it. Like I said, that's free. So if you want to go play with it and see what you've got, you can be up and running in about 10 clicks. Um, at, the, at the more mature version of the, of the industry, by the way, one of the other reasons we made Chariot is if you do a penetration test with us or a security assessment, it's much more than a penetration test. What you'll see is, yes, you'll get a report, but your primary point of interaction will be through Chariot. It's crazy to me that you wait three weeks and then you get a written report that you cut and paste into JIRA. With Chariot, as we find weaknesses or issues in your software stack in real time, we can load them up into Chariot for you to look at. So you're seeing results in real time as we find them and put them up. And then you can choose that they're actionable and push them straight into your JIRA with one click of a mouse. And we think that's how pen testing should be done. It's all about saving people time because we're short of people and we're short of time. Those are the things that challenge us. So let's look at a, a much more technical um, issue that we ran into. And this one was really unusual. I've never seen a bug quite like this. So you'll see at the bottom of this slide that we have the OWASP top 10. And I bet everyone on this call can tell me what the number one thing is. It's broken access control. And we see it a lot. It's number one for a reason. OWASP, you're very smart. Yes, it is the number one thing. And a, a really funky, cool example of this we saw was a customer who had a multi-tenant environment who was allowing customers to basically run SQL queries against their stuff or SQL-like queries. They were doing custom queries on customer-owned data. And the validation of, is this query okay, was based on query passing. So understanding that query, understanding what it does, and then making certain that it was querying something safe. So, you know, if you think about the simplest form of a query, it's select thing from place, right? Or select thing that matches some other thing from place. And provided that I'm allowed to access place, there's no problem. So the query parser would look at this, that look at the queries that came in and say, is, you know, am I querying from the places, the place that I'm allowed to access? Does that match my tenant ID? And the answer would be yes. The challenge with this is that you could nest queries. And if you tried hard enough, you could confuse the query parser about the nested queries, and it would see the outer query decide that you had access to that data and allow the query to go through. So on first glance, this sounds like SQL injection, right? But it's actually not, because the whole point is you're supposed to be able to taint that SQL. Um, the root cause is, in fact, not correctly looking at subject, object, action. And anytime we do that, that's usually broken access control. The, the trick is that as we increase the distance between the enforcement point and the policy uh, point, there's more and more room to go wrong. And in this case, the distance is increased by the complexity that's, that's present in the query. It was a really interesting volume because the underlying subquery was actually from a different system. Um, which was which is fascinating. It's, it's one of the few volumes that I've seen that work that way. What's interesting to me is how do we find queries like this? Well, automation is really difficult for this kind of query um, because it looks like SQL injection. And in fact, when we built a tool to solve for this kind of thing, we found this as SQL injection, and it's not. Um, but what we did realize is that automation, what we need are tools that are really, really quiet, that are developer friendly. So we built a Go vulnerability scanner that has a very, very, very quiet um, set of footprints, right? It's called GoCut. It's available on uh, GitHub. It has a pretty permissive license. So, you know, you can go and do cool things with it to your heart's content. And, and the philosophy is, when we see these complex vulnerabilities, the realization is that you have to catch the simple ones simply. But the current crop of static analysis tools has a really hard time with that because they're not very low noise. And again, just like running a dependency scanner, it doesn't work for, a, for an engineer if they keep getting PRs blocked. You need tools that are low noise, easy to use, because we don't need more tools, we need to use the tools we have. Um, 
we've had a lot of good traction with GoCart and uh, received a lot of good feedback. So I would I would like you to, if you can, if you're a Go shop, go on to GitHub, download it, tell me what you think of it. We use it ourselves uh, in house, and it's it finds real things and it's very very quiet. So you know. How do you deal with those more complex volumes? The answer is you move the burden for finding the simple volumes to machines and leave humans to do the more complex. Another theme that we see a lot is vulnerabilities that come around because of new technology. So it's an old vulnerability brought back to life because of new technology. So command injection is a pretty old vulnerability. We all know how it works, no rocket science, but we found some really interesting examples as people adopt Terraform of command injection via Terraform, um, which was fascinating, right? Was, I generally don't think of Terraform as, a, as an opportunity to command inject with user painted data, but in the real world, we've seen examples where that's exactly what could happen. So one of the challenges with these new tools as they enter the dev setup loop is we're not necessarily aware of what best practices are and we have to learn on the job. So this was a, a sort of interesting case where, where a, a customer was calling local exec um, with some tainted data. So what is local exec? So we'll, we'll go to the HashiCorp docs. The local exec provisioner um, invokes a local executable after a resource is created. So we create the resource, we create um, an execution within it, in the process running, um, Terraform, not on the resource. And so this can be very, very dangerous indeed, right? So if you're controlling the parameters, you can exact code in, in the resource. And this is classic command injection via tainted input. And so the takeaway is, as you bring new tools into your tool chain, right? The moral of the story is as we bring these new tools in, Yes, they're incredibly good for helping our security, right? I use Terraform. I love Terraform. I love a lot of the HashiCorp stuff. It's really cool. It allows me to deploy things in a more secure way. But I have to learn all about best practices again for a very complex tool chain. And these are all big tools, right? We're not talking about small, little tools. We're talking about very powerful power tools. And so understanding what best practices are is difficult. And it's a very difficult learning curve for your developers because your developers are typically on the hook to develop, not to be experts in security. So when technology is moving rapidly and the places we have misconfigurations continues to rise, I think we do the only thing that we, we can do to solve the problem and that's we embrace automation. So one of the things that we do in Praetorian is as we see new technologies come out where we see great power for improving security, but also the opportunity to create new vulnerabilities, we create tools and automation to let you know if there's a problem. So I'd like to introduce you to our newest open source tool, again, freely available on GitHub, um, on Git with a fairly uh, permissive license. Um, it's called Snowcat, and Snowcat is a vulnerability scanner for Istio. Now, Istio is a service mesh, and what I don't, I won't assume everybody knows everything about service meshes because not everybody's using them. What a service mesh allows us to do, essentially, in a SaaS application that's microservice based, is it allows you to handle all the wiring as infrastructure. So we can do things like engage in mutual TLS authentication between, between nodes trivially with Istio. You can introduce policies that are very fine grained with Istio. So if somebody penetrates one of your pods, there's only a limited number of places that that pod can get to. Uh, you can even do it up to and including endpoints. You can do A-B testing very easily with Istio. It's a power tool, I love it. Service meshes are great. They really can help your security but you can also misconfigure them, right? There's a lot of best practices that are not necessarily well known. So Snowcap will look through your configuration and it can either do this dynamically or as a static analysis tool and tell you about places that you may have misconfigured um, your, your stuff, right? Um, so it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty powerful. 
um, you, useful stuff. And again, freely available on GitHub. You can download it and start using it today at no charge. We're, we're very pleased with the tool. So, some closing thoughts. First of all, how do we get out of security hell, right? Security is really hard. Um, I'd like to tell you that the glass, oh, I have a glass here and now I will take a sip of it. Now it's in my hand. The glass actually is half full. At the high end of the world, um, the security is getting better, right? Our best clients, our most security mature clients, are putting up systems that are really very, very difficult to, uh, to beat and to find weaknesses in. They're doing an amazing job. And we're seeing, you know, a hardening where, where it is, it is uh, pretty difficult to, uh, to get in. We, we still usually, you know, we're like the Mounties, we usually get our man, but, it, but it's a lot of work. Um, so things are getting better, but there's a lot of stuff out there. And so it's still pretty easier to be an attacking defender. So, you know, there's some, there's some bright points in the horizon. What's common is common. Do make certain you've dealt with the OWASP top 10. It is not the only thing you have to deal with, but at least please, if you take one thing away, deal with the OWASP top 10 automatically, right? Use automation to allow your people to do the more esoteric manually. And then I would argue we don't need more tools. We need tools the way that work the way we already work. So here's my security industry analogy. Let's say I made you a six fingered glove. You'd try it on and you'd be like, oh, this, this doesn't fit, Rich. The security industry half the time would tell you to grow another finger instead of going, gee, maybe we could make gloves better. And that's not true of the entire industry, right? I'm not tiring us all with the same brush. But there is sometimes a tendency for security to think they have the answer and not listen to their customers enough. So, you know, as a community, how do we solve for it? First thing, expect more from your vendors. Um, you know, you, you're paying us a lot of money. Uh, you, you should expect a lot and you should get a lot and you should get things that solve your real pain. Um, but be reasonable about it, right? We're human, we're drowning in security too. Uh, but no, really raise the bar and vote with your pocketbooks. Vote with your eyeballs, vote with your pocketbooks. You have tremendous power as a community to move the needle, to shape the community for something better. And so tell us what you need, but tell us clearly and tell us repeatedly because repetition is kind of sometimes how we learn. And then lastly, engage in open source wherever you can. I'm a huge believer in the open source movement, free and open source software. Um, and when you run into shortfalls, don't get mad about it. Help us help be part of the solution. Let's say you download GoCart and you go, oh, Rich, this thing's getting things wrong here. Open an issue and we'll deal with it. Or better yet, if you've got some programming time, you know, and you want to program something over the weekend, fix the issue, an issue of PR and we'll take it. Pick your favorite project and give it some love because these open source projects can be transformational and better open source will make the whole world better. Uh, I truly believe that. So I'll leave the slide up with some resources. And then Gene, I kind of, kind of took a few extra seconds there, but I'm still amazed I got through that many slides in that amount of time. So what can, what can I tell you? What else do you want to hear about?